Hi, I'm Ben Mims, cooking columnist for the LA Times, and for Thanksgiving this year, I want to arm you with a collection of recipes for classic dishes that you can turn to this year and for years to come to cook the perfect holiday meal. Each year, I work for months to come up with new ideas for Thanksgiving recipes, and when they come out, I get a lot of friends and readers who say, that really sounds great, but can you just give me a basic recipe for a stuffing or cranberry sauce? Hmm. But I get it, Thanksgiving is tied really strongly to tradition, and people ultimately want really familiar flavors because that's the food that reminds them of home. So instead of coming up with anything new for Thanksgiving, I'm giving you my best recipes for really simple, really classic Thanksgiving dishes. Think of these recipes as templates that once you make them, you can riff off of and make them your own for your family and friends. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. To most people, there is no Thanksgiving without a turkey. And I know it can be overwhelming to cook a giant bird that you only make once a year, but I'm gonna show you my really easy method for making a turkey that's really delicious and as stress-free as possible. This is a big bird. Usually you wanna look for something around 12 to 16 pounds. This year, I got a 21 pounder. That was like the best I could do. So we're gonna talk about how to deal with birds that are in that range from 12 to 21 pounds, but I have my turkey. I've taken all the packaging off the outside and let it kind of dry. I wanna pat it dry with paper towels. It's gonna to help when it browns uh, later and to help kind of all the things that we're gonna to add to the turkey to make it taste really good. That's gonna help everything stick to the skin. So the first thing you wanna do is get rid of kind of all the things you don't need on the turkey. So this little pop-up thermometer here, we don't need that. We're gonna use our own thermometer to make sure that the bird is cooked really well. And then also, usually turkeys come with this little plastic handle, which makes it really convenient for lifting it up and moving it around. But once I have it on my baking sheet that I'm gonna roast the turkey on, I don't need it anymore. So just take your scissors, kind of snip it apart. Sometimes it can be really dug in really well to the back of the turkey, so you just wanna make sure that you can get that out pretty easily. Also, inside the turkey, you're gonna find the neck. And usually there's a bag at the front this time of all the organs and giblets. So you just wanna peel back that kind of like skin at the top. And there's usually the bag sitting right there. That has all the like the kidneys and all the organs you're gonna need. Save that for making turkey stock if you want to or for the gravy later on. So once you have all the plastic out, you want to trim off all this kind of excess skin. You can use your scissors or a knife. You just gotta trim it. So there's a little bit there, but not a lot. Excess hanging out. And then on the back side as well, there's usually the turkey's little tail, it's a little butt kind of hanging on. So you just wanna clip that off as well. Again, you can roast these, boil these, and cook all this together to make a really wonderful stock. If there's any excess skin or any kind of like big pieces of fat as well, kind of clip those off, save those too. A little bit of extra skin here, so I'll clip that off. And then if you want to, it's not totally necessary. The turkey's little thumbs here, you can kind of clip those off too. They usually come off pretty easily, just like that. This makes for a, a nicer looking wing on the turkey. Still with nothing on it, I like to kind of take the wings and just pin them back behind the whole body. That makes for really kind of even cooking, so you don't have these like wing tips burning on the outside. So I'll show you that one more time. You just want to lift up the turkey, take the wing, just kind of with a little bit of muscle. It can be slippery sometimes. Just kind of bend it back so it's pinned behind the turkey. That way you have a nice like Norman Rockwell shaped turkey. So now that we have the turkey kind of free from all the extra skin pieces, meat, and all the plastic, we're ready to season it with a really delicious butter. First thing we're going to do is take half a pound of butter, which is about two sticks. We're going to add this to a bowl like that. And then I want to flavor this butter with at least two things, which is salt and pepper. So I take a tablespoon of salt, which I know sounds like a lot, but this is a giant turkey, as you can see. So you want to make sure it has a lot of great flavor. And then about a teaspoon of freshly ground black pepper, which is like a third of a tablespoon. So I add this here. And so I'm just going to stir these up to incorporate the salt and pepper with the butter. You can absolutely, and you probably should, add a little more flavorings than just salt and pepper, but even if you just use salt and pepper, your turkey will taste great because this is gonna be stuffed under the skin of the turkey. It's gonna keep the breast really moist. 
It's gonna help kind of like fry the skin so it gets really crispy. And it's mostly just going to baste the turkey by itself. So you just wanna stir until it's all evenly combined. And now we're gonna grab our turkey again. And so before we kind of like lube this thing up with all the butter, we wanna be able to handle it really easily. So I wanna season the inside. So I just wanna kind of set it up like that on its neck and then just sprinkle the inside. Lots of salt and pepper because you might think this doesn't really do anything, but this does season the meat from the inside as well. So just kind of tip it to each side to make sure some salt lands in there. A little bit of pepper as well, just like that. This is a tip too, that whenever you are working with a turkey and seasoning it for Thanksgiving, put a little extra salt and pepper in some bowls that you can use with your turkey hands. That way you don't have to worry about any kind of cross-contamination. So now that we have the inside of the turkey seasoned, I'm going to separate the skin from the meat over the breast and that's where we're gonna put the butter. So here's what you wanna do. You wanna take your finger and just kinda of lift up the skin. And if you kind of press your finger where the skin meets the meat, it will kind of like break a really thin membrane and you wanna break through that and then just kind of like wiggle your finger back and forth and you'll kind of feel it open up. And you're kind of breaking that membrane that holds the skin to the meat. So you just wanna break that open, but you don't wanna like tear a huge hole in the skin because you want this to keep all that butter in that you're using to stuff the turkey. So again, lift up the skin, kind of press your finger where the skin kind of meets the flesh of the turkey until you find an opening and then just kind of wiggle your finger around. Again, make sure not to break the skin itself. You wanna keep that intact. If you have long fingernails, this might not be the job for you. Get someone that has short fingernails to do that. And then, so we did that over the kind of the lower quadrant of the breast. Now we're gonna do it over the upper part as well. So lift up that skin, press your finger where it meets the flesh. And then just go back and forth. And eventually you'll kind of meet that first part that you broke through over here. And you just wanna connect the two so you have one kind of like open pocket that's gonna hold all that butter. So now you have this big open pocket, we're gonna stuff that with our butter. So I like to use a spoon for this just because it helps scoop up some of the butter. And then also there's no sharp edges. So you can lift up the skin, find the kind of hole where you put, the, where you put your finger before, press the spoon in, and then use the skin to kind of rake it off the spoon like that. And now we're just gonna do that in all four kind of entry points that we made over the turkey before. So lift up the skin, find the hole, and then kind of use the skin to kind of rake the butter off the spoon, just like that. Now we'll do it in the bottom four as well. If a little butter gets on the outside or on your fingers, that's totally fine, because I'm gonna show you what to do with that in a second. So just use big spoonfuls of butter. Again, lift up the skin, press it in, rake it off. Just like that. Once you have all the butter under the skin and these kind of pockets are connected, you can just kind of mush the butter all over the breast, just like that, using the skin until they connect. Then you kind of have this really flavorful butter that is spread all over the turkey breast. And then you're gonna take all this extra butter that you just made, just wanna scrape it all onto the turkey, just like that and then use your hands and you wanna cover this turkey every square inch with that butter. So just kind of spread it around, just like that. Might be a little like kind of wet and doesn't wanna stick at first, but then you'll see eventually it'll kind of spread itself out. Make sure to get the wings as well. You'll make sure everything is covered with this butter. I mean, when a turkey's covered with two sticks of butter, you can't tell me it's not gonna taste good, even if it's just salt and pepper. And then once you have all that on there, so I'm gonna wash my hands and then we're gonna season the bird with some more salt and pepper. So now that I have the butter all over the turkey, and even though we have salt and pepper on the inside of the cavity, it's in the butter, and that's under the skin and on top, we wanna to add a little more. And that's just gonna to help to really season this bird because it's a pretty big bird. So I like to add maybe another tablespoon to two, depending on how big your turkey is. Evenly kind of sprinkle it all over the turkey. This is gonna season the skin a lot more, and then as you cut the pieces, once the turkey is done, it'll make sure that all that meat is really well seasoned, even down to the meat that's like by the bone as well. So just give a nice kind of like light, even coating. 
A lot of the salt also will kind of fall off the turkey into the pan and help kind of flavor the drippings and the fat that you're gonna to use to make the turkey as well. But you wanna make sure every piece has a lot of seasoning. Can you lift up the turkey a little bit to make sure you get the thigh as well. Just like that. So now we have this beautifully seasoned, buttered turkey. And it's ready to go in the oven, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually let this sit for at least overnight, preferably 24 hours, and that lets all the salt and pepper really get into the turkey, kind of create an even cooking environment. And then all we have to do on Thanksgiving morning is take it out of the refrigerator, pop it in the oven, and that'll be it. So I've let the turkey sit for a day in the refrigerator, and that, again, helped to get all the salt and pepper really into the meat of the bird and help it cook really evenly. So I actually took this turkey out about an hour and a half ago. That helps to ensure that it's really room temperature, which is gonna also help it roast really evenly. So before we stick it in the oven though, I'm gonna add some more aromatics to ensure that it's really flavorful. So what I like to do is take two large yellow onions and just cut them into pretty thick slices, probably about a third to half an inch. And what I'm gonna do is take all these slices and kind of put them on the bottom of a baking sheet. And this is going to one, kind of flavor all the drippings that we're gonna to use to make the gravy later. But also, if you don't have a rack, it helps to keep the turkey kind of lifted off the baking sheet so it doesn't steam on the bottom, but kind of gets nice and crispy. Just like that. And now, before you set the turkey on top of the onions, I'm also gonna put some lemons inside the turkey. And that's just gonna help really kind of perfume the turkey from the inside. So let's cut it into like four pieces, just like that. I'll do about two of these. If you have a smaller turkey, one's fine. If you have a big turkey, two or three, depending on the size of the lemons. And then just kind of stuff those inside the cavity like that. Once they come out, also as well, you can kind of squeeze the juices into the pan drippings, which adds even more flavor. Just like that, just until they fill the cavity. And so now that the lemons are in the turkey, I'm gonna take some kitchen twine, and I'm just gonna tie the legs together to make sure they cook evenly. This is what a lot of trussing is all about, is just making sure that all the meat cooks evenly in the bird. But you don't really have to do the whole bird and tie it up the way chefs used to. All you need to do is just ensure that the drumsticks are kind of tight into the breast. So I like to put some twine just under each drumstick, kind of loop the twine around the end, just like that, to kind of secure it in place. And then you just want to make a regular knot, just like this, kind of pull it together, and then another knot to secure it, just like that. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. You just wanna make sure that they're a little bit closer than they were before. Now you wanna take this whole turkey, and move it right on top of all those onions. See how that kind of lifts the turkey up so it's not gonna be sitting directly on the sheet pan. And so we're gonna take this big thing, we're gonna stick it in a 350 degree oven and roast it for around two and a half to three hours it works out to about 10 to 13 minutes a pound, but it really depends on the size of the bird and how cold it is going into the oven. So I like to start checking it at around two and a half hours, then every 30 minutes until an instant read thermometer stuck into the thickest part of the thigh reads 160 degrees. So the turkey came out of the oven at just under three hours for about a 21 pound turkey. Let it sit here for about 45 minutes to make sure it's really cool. I think a lot of people think that, you know, it comes out and you want to eat it right away or maybe even let it rest for like 10 minutes. But a turkey is, especially a turkey like this, is very big. It's going to be very hot in there still. So you could probably let it sit for about an hour or so and that will still be fine. It'll still be plenty hot for dinner. So now I want to take my turkey and I want to transfer it to my cutting board. And you know, if you don't have a carving fork or anything like that, I actually like to use two tongs. And I like to put one kind of in the front of the turkey and then one in the back and just kind of lift them together. That way you don't pierce the skin too bad or kind of like rip any pieces off, just like that. And then I'm gonna take all these delicious juices that have the butter that came off the turkey, the onions, some of the lemon from the inside, and all the salt and pepper that went into that and all the kind of brown bits on the bottom. So you're gonna take the baking sheet very carefully, very slowly, kind of pour the drippings through a sieve and you can save these onions. I like to spoon them around the turkey once I've carved it. And then just drain the onions out. Now you have all the really wonderful drippings 
the fat from mixing with the turkey fat and the butter. It's really flavorful. So you can use all that to make gravy. Now you have these lovely onions. You can spoon all around the turkey when it comes time to carve it. And so now you have a perfect roast turkey ready to carve and serve for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving gravy can often be an afterthought, but it really is the dish that ties the whole meal together. So really great gravy starts with really great turkey drippings. So I have the fat that I skimmed off of turkey drippings that I made earlier, and then all the drippings and kind of liquid that came out of it as well. That's kind of like our stock that we're gonna use for the gravy. And when you pour off the drippings and you don't have enough, a good thing to do is just buy some chicken stock that you can add to it. So we need about four cups of liquid. And then I've also measured out about four tablespoons of turkey fat here that came from roasting. So it's turkey fat mixed with the butter that we used earlier. But I'm gonna set these aside for now while we work on the aromatics. It starts with a shallot. And I have about four cloves of garlic and about a teaspoon of thyme. I'm using shallots just because they're pretty mild. But if you don't have a shallot, but you have say a quarter of a yellow onion, just use that. You could use red onions, you could use scallions, anything that's around that has that kind of like really nice kind of mild onion flavor. But you want it to be pretty fine because this is gonna be the gravy that you kind of spoon over the everything else on your plate. So then we're just gonna finely chop the garlic. So I have about a tablespoon of thyme leaves. You can use rosemary if you have that. And if you don't have thyme or rosemary, you can use parsley. Honestly, any kind of green herb just to give it a little bit of that freshness and kind of like green flavor. So once you have all three of these kind of things combined, this is gonna be kind of, think of it like your flavor pile. Like aromatics are gonna make sure that whether you have turkey drippings or like vegetable stock, whether you're using olive oil or turkey fat, it's all gonna taste good no matter what. So I have a medium saucepan. I'm just gonna warm up the turkey fat until it kind of melts in the saucepan. And now we're gonna add the shallots, garlic, and thyme to the fat and cook these over about medium heat just until they're really soft and starting to brown at the edges. So now the aromatics have been cooking for just a few minutes and the garlic will be the first thing that goes brown. So as soon as the garlic starts to turn light brown, that's when you know you're ready. And so just like with making a white sauce for mac and cheese or a gratin or anything like that, we wanna add some flour now to the fat and that's gonna help thicken the gravy. This is about a quarter cup plus two tablespoons. So you just wanna stir the flour around until it makes a thick paste. And you wanna cook it for about a minute just to kinda of take that raw flour taste out. I like to switch to a whisk. This kinda of helps when you're whisking in the stock and drippings to make sure that they don't form lumps. So just kind of whisking constantly. So I'm slowly pour the stock into the flour and the aromatics. And you wanna increase the heat to about like medium, medium high. And just keep whisking this as it comes to a boil. That also ensures there's no lumps that form in the gravy. Okay, so the gravy's now come to a boil, and as soon as it does that, you just wanna lower the heat. The gravy is already thickened enough to where we want it, but we wanna let the kind of shallots and garlic and thyme kind of marry with the stock. So we just wanna simmer it for about five more minutes. So I'm gonna take it off the heat, and now it's time to season the gravy. So for this amount of gravy, I add about a teaspoon and a half of salt. If you're using stock or your drippings are really salty, maybe start with one teaspoon and then taste from there. And then about half a teaspoon of freshly ground black pepper. You can also leave that out too if you don't want pepper in the gravy. So just whisk those together. And then just because it's the holidays, it's Thanksgiving, I like to add a little bit of brandy as well. Two tablespoons, you can eyeball it. A little more, a little less. But it really pairs well kind of complements the like turkey flavor that you have from the roasted turkey drippings. The garlic and shallots and thyme makes it really aromatic. It smells really wonderful. And there you go. The gravy is done. All you need to do now, is just kind of pour it into a serving dish. Pass this around the table. And there you have the perfect gravy. I'm putting over stuffing, turkey, or anything else on your plate. Stuffing is really special because we really only get to eat it once a year at Thanksgiving. And I'm gonna show you my take on a classic recipe using sourdough bread and herbs.
So the first thing we need is lots of aromatics to flavor the stuffing. So I have eight stalks of celery and two yellow onions, and I'm just gonna give these a rough chop. That's about three cups. And so now I'm gonna cut up two large yellow onions. And this is about six cups of chopped onions. And now we're gonna cook all this down in about a quarter cup of olive oil in a big pot over about medium heat. So that way they don't burn, but they get really nice and sweet and soft. And to make sure they really have a lot of flavor while they cook down, I'm gonna add a lot of the seasoning right now. So I add about a tablespoon of salt and about a teaspoon of freshly ground black pepper. So I'm just gonna stir these together. We're gonna let these cook, stirring them you know, every few minutes when you think about it for about 20, 25 minutes. You'll know they're ready when they're really soft, kind of translucent, and just starting to brown at the edge. Okay, so while the onions and celery are cooking, we're gonna chop up some garlic and herbs that are gonna flavor the aromatics as well. So I have about four cloves of garlic here. If you like more garlic, you can absolutely use more. So I'm just gonna give it kind of quick rough chop, put it off to the side. And now our herbs, and this is gonna give, you know, all the flavor in the stuffing. I think mean, kind of keep it classic. I like to use rosemary, sage, and thyme. So you want about two tablespoons of each herb, kind of these like kind of hearty winter herbs. They're really classic with stuffing. Another little rough chop off to the side. And then with sage leaves, you know, a lot of times you can get sage leaves that are a little big like this and kind of velvety, but then also they come in these kind of smaller bits. Whatever you get, you just want to make sure that after you chop it, you have about two tablespoons. So. So I kind of give those a rough chop and also off to the side. And now our thyme. And you know, a lot of people say to pull the leaves backwards to get them off the stem leaf, but I always find that this happens. It kind of breaks off and then you have to like go back, get the leaves off and pick off more of the stem and you're like, what's going on? So I actually like to just go the opposite way because if you hold them by this end and pull, then where the stem naturally breaks off is so soft, you just chop it up with the leaves. So it's a lot less tedious. You don't have to worry about going back and picking off individual leaves. I'm gonna bring back my garlic, my rosemary and sage. Just give everything a good chop together. And you know, you don't have to do this. You can chop everything individually, but I like to kind of combine it all. It makes it more efficient. And you have all the herbs and garlic just kind of mixed together. It's really beautiful. So now all of our celery and onions have been kind of slowly sweating, sauteing for about 20, 25 minutes. So now it's time to add all the garlic and herbs that we chopped earlier. Just cook them for about two or three minutes. It immediately smells like Thanksgiving. It smells so good. So we're just gonna cook this, like again, for just a couple minutes. This recipe uses three cups of vegetable stock, which I find to be kind of like the gold deluxe amount. And then immediately you want to turn the heat off. I set that off to the side and let it cool. I made a recipe that uses fresh bread. You can toast the bread to kind of dry it out if you want to. That just adds an extra step. So I like to just use fresh bread. This is just a really plain kind of like country loaf from the grocery store. So I just want to cut it in about one inch thick slices and then cut it the other way in about one inch cubes. So now that I have all the bread in the bowl, I'm gonna take all the aromatics and that stock that I cooked earlier. Just wanna stir it to make sure you get all those brown bits off the bottom of the pot, if there are any. And we're gonna pour this right over the bread. And kind of flavor it all the way to the core. Make sure you get all those onions all the aromatics, bits of herbs and garlic out of the pot. You don't want to waste anything. I'm going to give everything a big toss to make sure, you know, all the stock and aromatics kind of evenly soaking into the bread. And then instead of baking this right away, what you actually want to do is kind of let this sit for about 10 minutes. Maybe stir it once while it's sitting. So now we're going to add a few more seasonings. You know, we added lots of salt to the aromatics before but I always like to add a little more at the end as well, just because you've added all that bread and stock as well. So an extra teaspoon of salt goes on at the end. And then also I like to add two tablespoons of red wine vinegar, just like coated in all those aromatics and the olive oil and just makes it really light and kind of brightens it up. 
give them a stir one more time to make sure they're really evenly combined with all the bread. And then so far, the stuffing is vegan. You know, we use vegetable stock for the stuffing. We have aromatics. The bread is vegan as well. What we want to add next though is eggs. If you're vegan, just leave the eggs out. It'll make for a looser uh, texture to the stuffing, but that's totally fine. It'll still taste great. But if you're not, you can add some eggs, help kind of bind everything together. So I like to crack the eggs into a bowl first. Just kind of break them up so they're nice and loose. And then we'll pour this over the stuffing and then stir it once more just to make sure all the egg coats all the pieces of bread. So now we're gonna transfer this to a nine by 13 baking dish. Brush this with olive oil instead of butter, which you could absolutely use butter if you want to. Just a couple tablespoons. Greasing a pan like this obviously helps to kind of add flavor to the stuffing. It also makes it easy to scoop the stuffing out, but also with the oil, it helps to really brown the edges. So now we're just gonna pour all the stuffing into the pan. You're gonna have to pile it up a little bit. It's gonna look like it's not gonna fit in, but it will. Just like that. Evenly distribute it in the pan, but you don't wanna press it down and compact it. You wanna kind of let it be loose. Cover the top with a sheet of foil. And that lets the stuffing kind of cook through in the center. And then after about 30 minutes, we're gonna uncover it. There's a little more olive oil over the top. That helps to brown the top as well. And then we'll continue cooking it for about 45 minutes at 375 degrees. So here is our sourdough and herb stuffing. It's nice and brown and crispy. All those herbs and aromatics really smell wonderful. This is the perfect thing to serve with your turkey, your gravy, and everything else on your Thanksgiving plate. This cornbread dressing is flavored with pork sausage, chili flakes, and aromatics, and is a great alternative to a traditional bread stuffing for Thanksgiving. So to get started, first thing we're gonna do is brown the sausage. So I have four tablespoons of butter, I'm gonna melt in a pan. What I like for this recipe is breakfast pork sausage because usually breakfast pork sausages have sage, which is a traditional Thanksgiving herb. Break the sausage up with your fingers as you add it in. It's gonna give it a stir. And as it cooks, you wanna to continue to kind of break it up again into small pieces so it gets distributed in the dressing really well. And so while that works, we're gonna chop the aromatics for the stuffing as well. So first thing I'm gonna need is just two stalks of celery. You don't have to worry too much about being perfect when chopping for things like this. This is, you know, rustic home cooking for Thanksgiving, so just be casual. And then just kind of cut it into about quarter inch pieces like so. You want the celery to still be big enough so that you can taste it in the stuffing and not kind of disappear. And then we'll chop the onion about the same size pieces. So one kind of medium uh, yellow onion. So you wanna cut right down through the center. They're more or less the same size as the celery. So the sausage has been cooking for about eight to 10 minutes and we just want to get it brown and cooked through. It's just starting to caramelize on the bottom and it's rendered out a lot of its fat and mixed with the butter. And so that's what we're gonna cook our aromatics in. So I'm gonna add the celery and all of our onions. And at this point, you wanna season the aromatics to make sure they're really well seasoned and not just salty at the end. So I like to add about two teaspoons of salt, and about a teaspoon of freshly ground black pepper. And then to kind of balance the kind of savory sweet sausage with the sweet cornbread we're gonna add later, I like to add about half a teaspoon of chili flakes. You can add more if you want it spicier or less if you don't. So just gonna give these a stir. Make sure to coat all the onions and the celery with all that like really nice pork fat that we've just rendered out in the butter. So we're gonna stir this for about 12 to 14 minutes until the aromatics get really soft and just start to caramelize. So now that the onions and celery and sausage have all been cooking away for about 12 to 14 minutes, starting to get really nice and caramelized, this has kind of created our flavor base for the whole stuffing. What I wanna do is I'm gonna pour in about three cups of stock. You can use chicken stock, you can use vegetable stock, whatever you'd like. 
and just kind of scrape and just make sure all those like caramelized bits from the sausage and the onions and celery that you, you know, browned and were stuck to the bottom pan, you want to get those up because that, again, is going to add a lot of flavor. So once you get it all stirred up and it's done, you can kill the heat and we're going to let this cool while we crumble up our cornbread. So this recipe uses a 9 by 13 brick of cornbread. And I actually developed this to be used for making something like a Jiffy cornbread mix. So in the South, where cornbread dressing is more popular, a lot of us have, or a lot of people have cornbread lying around, but elsewhere, you really don't. So you can just bake a fresh batch, let it cool, and then use it for your cornbread. So I like to just break pretty large pieces of it because as you mix in the stock and all the aromatics, the pieces are gonna kind of fall apart. So now I'm gonna take all the aromatics in the stock and pour them over the cornbread. And now we're gonna add our eggs. If you don't wanna use eggs, you don't have to, but I like to, so I'm gonna add some eggs to the dressing just to kind of bind it. So I just wanna lightly beat them, just to kind of loosen them up. And then pour them over the dressing, like so, all the other aromatics. Give this a stir, make sure it's all evenly combined, then let it sit for about 10 minutes. And what that does is it allows all that stock that you poured into the aromatics to really absorb evenly into every piece of the cornbread. And as you can see, you know, I broke these into large chunks, but already they're kind of falling apart. And that's fine, that's good, that's what you want. Okay, so this mixture has now been sitting for about 10 minutes to make sure that it's really evenly moistened. And so before I put it in the pan, I actually like to add the last teaspoon of salt here, because I feel like, you know, if you add it all at the beginning, it's not properly seasoned, you want to kind of that last bit of salt. And now I'm going to transfer this to a pre-greased 9 by 13 baking dish. You can use the same pan, honestly, that you baked the cornbread in earlier. So gently kind of spoon it all in. And then use your spoon, just kind of Press it lightly. You just want to make sure that you have nice, even distribution of the sausage and the aromatics and all the cornbread, just like that. So first, what we're going to do is cover this with aluminum foil. Let it bake for about 30 minutes. That helps to kind of warm it through and kind of set the eggs. And then we'll uncover the dish, drizzle it with about two tablespoons of butter, and that will help brown the top. And we'll keep baking it until everything is really nice and crusty and bubbly. Now the cornbread dressing has been baking for 45 minutes with that butter on top. So it's nice and crunchy and golden brown on top, still moist inside. It's all ready to go on your Thanksgiving table. Green bean casserole is a nostalgic part of the Thanksgiving table, and I'm gonna show you how to make my green bean gratin, which is just as comforting, but uses fresh ingredients. So the first thing we need is green beans, of course. And what I'm gonna do first, I have them all trimmed on the ends. I'm gonna line them up in bundles like this and cut them in like thirds, I would say. And these are kind of, you know, the thicker, kind of American style green beans. Uh, you can definitely use Eric Vert, which are those like French, kind of thinner, more tender green beans as well, but those will cook in less time. These are gonna take around five to six minutes. And we have about one and a half pounds of green beans here. So I'm just gonna transfer them to a bowl. And so just like with cooking pasta or boiling potatoes, things like that, you want to make sure that the water that you cook the green beans in is really highly seasoned with lots of salt. We're gonna add salt later to the casserole, but you also want the beans to be really well seasoned as well. So as you take about half a handful for this amount of water and pour it in, it's about two, three tablespoons. And then we're gonna add our green beans to the boiling water. So while these cook, we're gonna cut our mushrooms. And these are regular old cremini mushrooms. You can use oyster mushrooms or trumpet mushrooms, anything else that you wanna use. It doesn't have to be these. You can use good old white button mushrooms as well. And I'm just gonna slice them pretty thick because I want, you know, nice hearty pieces in the casserole. And this is about eight ounces. Just 
gonna check on the beans. Just get, stir them every once in a while just to make sure they're cooking really evenly. You know, green bean casserole is one of those dishes that everyone wants to have at Thanksgiving and you know, it's really easy. It's usually a can of green beans, a can of cream mushroom soup, and that's it, and you bake it in the oven. And I understand the ease of that, but I feel like it's a really wonderful dish to make from scratch, just so you still have, you know, that kind of like comforting feeling, but a little bit fresher ingredients than the canned stuff. Okay, so the green beans have been boiling now for about six minutes. I'm gonna show you exactly what you wanna look for. So I'm just gonna fish one out. So put it on your cutting board, and then you wanna take your knife and just kind of press it lightly on the bean, and if it goes through pretty cleanly with little resistance, you know you're good. It's still lightly firm, but it's not soft. So this is perfect. So using a spider, I'm just gonna take these out of the water. And see, they're still nice and bright green. We haven't cooked them so long, they've lost their color, which is exactly what we want. Now that we have our green beans out, I'm gonna drain the pot, and then we're gonna bring it back and use it to make our sauce. So now I'm gonna set this pot aside while we cook the mushrooms. So first thing we need is about two tablespoons of butter in a large skillet. Put that over about medium heat as well. Let that melt. I'm gonna add the mushrooms and I'm gonna season these right away with about half a teaspoon of salt. Give those a stir make sure they're coated with the butter. Now we're gonna let these cook for about eight to 10 minutes, stirring them every once in a while until all the mushrooms kind of give up their moisture, become really tender, and get nice and golden brown at the edges. So while the mushrooms are browning, I'm gonna get started on the aromatics for the white sauce. So I'm gonna cut up two shallots and about four cloves of garlic. So now the mushrooms have been cooking for about eight to 10 minutes. And this is exactly what you want them to look like, kind of golden brown at the edges. Kill the heat and let those just sit aside and like cool in the pan while we make the white sauce for the gratin. So this starts with four tablespoons of butter, and we're just gonna melt it in the pot that we cooked the green beans in earlier. I'm gonna put this over about medium heat. I'm gonna add our chopped shallots and our garlic to the pot. We're just gonna cook these down till they're nice and tender and sweated, but we don't wanna get them really brown. And now I'm gonna sprinkle in about a third a cup of flour. Now this is the base of our, our white sauce. This is what's gonna thicken it similar to a white sauce you would make for like mac and cheese or even making gravy. And we wanna cook this kind of like roux mixture that's flavored with the shallots and garlic for about a minute or so. And that just kind of cooks off the raw flavor of the flour. I'm actually gonna switch over to a whisk to pour in our milk. And this just helps to prevent any lumps in the sauce as well. So we have two cups of whole milk. The way to prevent lumps is just to do this slowly. So like while you're whisking the roux, kind of want to slowly Add the milk, and eventually the kind of steam subsides. And it smooths out. So now once you have all the milk added, we're gonna keep whisking this as it heats up and we're gonna bring it to a boil. And that's gonna help to activate the flour and thicken the sauce, make a nice creamy kind of gravy to coat the green beans and the mushrooms for the gratin. So once the sauce comes to a boil, and you see it thickens into this really nice kind of creamy sauce, you're done. So we're just gonna take it off the heat because we don't wanna thicken it anymore. And now we're gonna add back those green beans that we cooked earlier, straight into the sauce. And we're gonna add the mushrooms that we cooked off earlier as well. And now the next ingredients are just to flavor the sauce and make sure that it tastes really good and kind of like classic gratin seasonings as well. So we're gonna add about a half a cup of Parmesan cheese. That makes anything taste better. It also kind of just makes for a nice kind of creamy, cheesy sauce as well. About a half a cup of heavy cream. Again, this kind of makes it a little richer. It thins the sauce just a little bit. About two tablespoons of lemon juice. You know, you want the cream, you want the cheese, you want that nice like milky white sauce, but this kind of helps to cut through all that richness in a really nice way. And now we're gonna add our seasonings. We're gonna do about one and a half teaspoons of kosher salt. And then we're gonna add about half a teaspoon of freshly ground black pepper as well. And it's something that's really classic in kind of like bechamel uh, white sauces and gratin dishes is nutmeg. So I like to add 
about a quarter teaspoon of freshly grated nutmeg, and you can just kind of eyeball it and do it straight into the pot. 12 to 16, quick little grating, just like that. We're just gonna stir everything together. And it's just enough sauce to coat them, but not kind of drown them, so you still have plenty of green beans and mushrooms in each bite. Transfer it to a nine inch square baking dish. You can use a metal pan, you can use a casserole dish, whatever you have. I'm just gonna scrape this right into the pan. Kind of spread it out evenly in the pan. Classically, green bean casserole gets, you know, those kind of French fried onions on top. But in keeping with the gratin theme of the dish, I'm also gonna add a little more Parmesan cheese. So if you wanna use the onions, you can use about, about a cup or so, I would say, over the top of the gratin. If you don't like these onions, you can absolutely use uh, those Thai fried onions that they f you can get at a Thai grocery store, or you can fry your own, but I don't mind these. Also, if you don't like any fried onions at all, you can mix some Parmesan with some breadcrumbs and just sprinkle that over the top. Anything to give it kind of like a nice, kind of crispy, crunchy topping. So then we're gonna add about a quarter cup of more grated Parmesan on top as well. Now we're gonna put this in a 375 degree oven for about 40, 45 minutes until it's bubbling in the center and nice and golden brown on top. So the green bean gratin baked for about 45 minutes. So it's nice and bubbly. The green beans and mushrooms are coated in that really lovely cheesy sauce. You have the Parmesan and the fried onions on top. This is a really wonderful update on green bean casserole, but I promise it's gonna taste a lot more delicious. My Thanksgiving meal is not complete without sweet potato casserole. It is the dish that screams Thanksgiving the most to me. So I'm gonna show you my absolute favorite way to make it. So the first thing we need, of course, is sweet potatoes. You know, so there's a lot of confusion around what's a sweet potato, what's a yam, they are two different vegetables, but oftentimes in grocery stores, they're labeled differently or they're mislabeled. All you need to know for this dish is you want the orange thing. So make sure that the flesh is orange, whether it's labeled a sweet potato or whether it's labeled a yam, and you're in business. So what I'm gonna do is just take all the peel off about three pounds of sweet potatoes, and then I'm gonna cut them up into about a one inch dice, and we're gonna put them in a pan to roast them in the oven. So the next thing I need is apples, and so what I want to do with the sweet potato casserole, because a lot of the old recipes call for a lot of sugar and spices, it's basically pumpkin pie, but as a side dish. So to try to make it something that's not dessert, I want to sweeten it more naturally. So instead of using white granulated sugar, I'm going to use really good sweet apples, some orange juice, and then a little bit of honey as well. I like to use Granny Smith apples because they're sweet, but they're also a little tart. And so it adds nice balance to sweet. Sweet potatoes, but you want about a pound, which is usually about two kind of average size apples. So I'm just gonna peel these, core them, and cut them about the same size pieces as the sweet potatoes, and then add them to the pan as well. So make sure they're evenly combined. The sweet potatoes and apples need a little bit of liquid to help them steam in the oven, so I'm gonna use half a cup of orange juice. If you don't have orange juice, you can use apple juice, you can use apple cider. Uh, you can even use water if you really want to, but you know, since we need some liquid to help the vegetable steam, it's nice that it has a little flavor of its own as well to kind of complement everything else that's going on. Then I'm gonna add about two tablespoons of honey, which I feel like gives it enough sweetness, but it's not too much. I'm just gonna kind of eyeball it. You can use a little bit more if you want to, or a little bit less. So just kind of drizzle it evenly over the sweet potatoes and apples, just like that. And then because we want to make this a side dish and not really a dessert, we're gonna add a little bit more salt than you would normally do. So I'm gonna add about two teaspoons of salt, which also really helps to ensure that it has, everything is really well seasoned throughout the whole dish. We're gonna cover the top with foil. This is gonna go in a 400 degree oven for about an hour. So the sweet potatoes and apples baked in the oven for about an hour with the foil on the whole time. And again, that kind of helped them to steam until they're really nice and soft. Let all the orange juice and the honey kind of get into the sweet potatoes as well. So I remove the foil. And now what I want to do is mash these sweet potatoes. I'm just gonna scrape all the 
sweet potatoes and you see the apples kind of just like fall to mush, which is what you want. Next year we're gonna save the pan that we cooked the sweet potatoes and apples in, because that's what we're gonna cook, the actual casserole in as well. So just take a good old potato masher, just mash the sweet potatoes and apples together. This will leave it, you know, slightly chunky. Again, if you don't want, if you want a perfectly smooth puree, you can do it in a food processor or a food mill. You can even use a hand blender if you want to, but it's pretty soft. All the vegetables kind of break down and become a really nice, smooth puree with very little effort. So I have about four tablespoons of butter. And we're just gonna let that kind of melt in to the hot potatoes. And then even though we added some salt to the potatoes earlier, we're gonna add another teaspoon. Just kind of mix that in here at the end as well. And then because we're gonna cover this sweet potato mixture with a meringue on top to kind of simulate our marshmallows, we're gonna need some egg yolks. What that does is actually, you know, it keeps it from just being, you know, some mashed sweet potatoes and the egg yolks help kind of bind it as well. If there's any kind of like separation from the sweet potatoes, the egg yolks kind of help emulsify that as well, make a nice kind of like smooth casserole. Okay, so now that I've separated my four eggs, I'm going to set the whites aside and we're gonna use those for the meringue in a minute. And I wanna add the egg yolks to the sweet potato mixture. Just kind of mash them around as well until they're really nice and smooth and incorporated in the sweet potatoes. That looks perfect. I'm gonna take the sweet potato mixture, put it back into the pan that we saved from earlier that we roasted the sweet potatoes in. See, this is nice and smooth, but also has a little bit of texture. So it's perfect, just like that. So you just wanna smooth the sweet potatoes out in the dish. I'm gonna turn the oven down to 350 degrees, and we're gonna bake this for about 20 minutes while we work on the meringue. Okay, so now that the sweet potatoes are baking in the oven, it leaves us plenty of time to make the meringue that's gonna go on top. So this starts with a cup of sugar and those four egg whites that we separated earlier. So we're gonna mix them together in a heat-proof glass bowl. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna set these over a pan of simmering water, like a double boiler. Stir the egg whites and sugar pretty steadily, doesn't have to be too fast, for a few minutes just until you can stick an instant read thermometer in the egg whites and they read around 170 degrees, which is just before they start to coagulate, but they're still cooked. And what that will do will create a really stable meringue. This takes about six to eight minutes. I'm gonna remove it from the water bath. I'm gonna quickly make sure that it tastes really good. So I'm gonna add a teaspoon of vanilla extract, just like that. And then half a teaspoon of fine sea salt, which again, makes sure that it tastes really good, has lots of flavor tastes better than those marshmallows you would normally put on top. And now take a hand mixer, and we're gonna mix it for about four to five minutes until stiff peaks form. So once you've beaten the egg whites to this nice fluffy meringue, I'm gonna show you what you wanna look for. You wanna lift your beater out of the meringue, and if it just kind of gently curls over like a wave, that's perfect. If it's a little heavy and kind of like falls in a ribbon, you still need to whip it a little more, but this is perfect. It's nice and light and fluffy, kind of like marshmallow fluff. Now we're gonna set this aside while I go grab the sweet potatoes, and then we can top them and broil it until it's nice and toasty. So now the sweet potato and apple mixture has been baking for about 20 minutes, so it's nice and hot and cooked through in the middle. So we're gonna take our meringue that we just whipped up, scrape it right into the center. So just take your spatula and just kind of spread the meringue evenly over the sweet potatoes. Leave like half an inch border around the outside just so you know what it is. And it's just enough marshmallow to lend some sweetness to the sweet potatoes without it being too over the top. And now we're gonna pop this under the broiler just to cook the meringue through and get it nice and toasted on top. So after about two, two and a half minutes under the broiler, the meringue is nice and toasted on top. So you have all those really sweet, 
sweet potatoes that were sweetened with apples and orange juice and honey. Just enough of the meringue on top so it still feels like comforting and nostalgic, but this is a nice modern update on a great Thanksgiving sweet potato casserole. Of all the dishes at Thanksgiving, it seems that everybody agrees there has to be mashed potatoes, and I'm gonna show you how I like to make them. So the first thing I'm gonna start with is some potatoes, of course, and I'm gonna start peeling them. And you know, my philosophy when it comes to mashed potatoes, especially for Thanksgiving, is that you have a lot of things that are really rich going on on the table. You have the gravy, you have your stuffing, all these different casseroles. So I like to treat the mashed potatoes as a somewhat kind of, not bland, but blank canvas for all the other kind of things you're gonna put on it. So the first way I like to do that is to actually use russet potatoes because they're a little bit drier and that makes for a lighter mashed potato. You can absolutely leave the peels on if you want to, but you know, we want kind of like smooth and creamy mashed potatoes. So I like to take them off. And then the other thing that makes these mashed potatoes really light is because we're already gonna add a stick of butter to them. So I like to also add some buttermilk, which gives that kind of rich dairy, sour tang, but without being super heavy like sour cream, creme fraiche, or things like that. I'm just gonna continue peeling my potatoes and then cut them in about two inch dice before we boil them. So kind of cut them lengthwise and then crosswise into roughly thirds and now it's time to boil them. So mashed potatoes need a lot of salt and we're gonna add salt later to season them once we've mashed them, but even before, we wanna make sure we salt the boiling water that's gonna cook them to really get some salt into the potatoes as well. So I like to add, just eyeball it, but like a rough handful of kosher salt. We're just gonna pile them into the water and let them cook for about 15 to 18 minutes until you can pierce them really easily with the point of a knife. And I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, so the potatoes have been boiling for about 15 to 18 minutes. And I'm gonna show you what you wanna look for. You wanna pull the potato out of the water. It should be a little rough around the edges. And then you wanna take the tip of a paring knife and just kind of poke it right in the center. And the knife should go in and out pretty easily. And that means these are ready. So now, I'm just gonna take these over to the sink and drain them. So I've drained my potatoes and actually what I want to do is return them to the pot that I boiled them in because the pot is still warm and also dirties one less dish. And then while they're still warm, this is when I want to add the butter to let it kind of melt into the potatoes. Let the butter sit out for about, you know, a couple hours if you can, just so it's not ice cold going into the potatoes. Just get yourself a good potato masher and go to town. Probably won't be as super smooth as if you used a ricer, but that's totally fine. So just kind of stir until all the butter is melted. And now we're gonna add a cup and a half of buttermilk. And again, this kind of adds that really nice, kind of rich dairy tang, but it's honestly not that rich. It's pretty nice and light. And it gives the mashed potatoes a really nice consistency. It's not so like thick, it's like really smooth and a little bit thinner, which I like for this. Once all that buttermilk has been absorbed, you'll have really nice, light, really smooth mashed potatoes. So that's the mashed potato part, but actually the most important part is making sure that it's properly salted. So again, this is gonna sound like an insane amount of salt, but for this amount of potatoes, with all that butter and buttermilk you just put in, you need a lot. So I'm gonna use about a tablespoon and a half of kosher salt. And this is diamond crystal kosher salt, which is what we use in the test kitchen. If you're using like Morton's kosher salt, which is a little bit saltier, you're gonna to wanna to use a little less. And if you're using kind of iodized fine salt, you wanna use a little less as well. But start with at least a tablespoon and then go from there. And honestly, this is all you need. Some people don't like pepper. I like to add pepper, so I'm gonna add about one and a half teaspoons, which is about half a tablespoon here. Pepper in like that. Stir it around, make sure it's really Nicely combined. And now, I'll just transfer it to my serving dish. These smell so buttery. 
and rich, but again, not too rich because we use buttermilk instead of cream or sour cream, anything like that. I also like to put a little bit of green on top. So I'm just gonna take some chives and scallions, just a little, maybe about a teaspoon of each. Just kind of thinly slice like that and put them on top. It gives it kind of like a quasi ranch feeling, you know, with the buttermilk and everything. So it kind of gives them also a nice little green, fresh flavor to go on top. So there you have really simple, buttery, light mashed potatoes for Thanksgiving. Cranberry sauce is actually my favorite part of the Thanksgiving meal because it comes in to kind of cut through all the heavy richness of the other foods on the meal. So I'm gonna show you how to make a really classic, simple cranberry sauce. When you go shopping for cranberries in the grocery store, somewhat frustratingly, they're sold in different amounts. If you go to the farmer's market and you can get fresh ones, they come in these kind of eight ounce containers. Sometimes if you get them in bags, they can be 12 ounces. I've seen seven ounces or even 10 ounces as well. And then if you get in them in the freezer section, sometimes it can be like a pound, two pounds, pound and a half. So I created this recipe to be an even pound. So it's four cups. You can make more, you can cut it in half if you need to. And it's a really even number. So first thing we're gonna do is take our four cups of cranberries and put them into a medium saucepan. So what I like to add is a cup and a quarter of granulated sugar. Now, if you want a more assertive cranberry sauce, you can go down to a cup. If you want a little bit sweeter, a cup and a half, but I kind of find a cup and a quarter to be the nice Goldilocks uh, measurement of granulated sugar. You can also use brown sugar if you wanted to, but this is good old plain granulated sugar. The next thing you need, you know, you could, cranberry sauce could just be cranberries and sugar, but you need a little liquid to kind of help it cook and kind of break up the tough skins of the cranberries. So we're gonna use half a cup of apple cider here. And again, that's just to kind of help dissolve the sugar and just give you know some liquid to cook the cranberries in. And then next is spices. I'm just gonna use one cinnamon stick, but you could of course use star anise, you could use allspice, you could use cloves, cardamom, things like that. You want some kind of like warming spice. I find one stick to be perfect. And actually one of the most important things about the whole recipe is adding salt, because you have you know all these berries and it's a lot of sugar, but you need to balance it with a good half a teaspoon of kosher salt. It's completely optional, but I like to add some citrus zest to the cranberry sauce as well, right into the cranberry sauce. And you kinda just wanna go around, take your time, and get every last bit of zest off the orange. And then we're gonna save the orange so that while the cranberries cook, we're gonna cut it up and then add it and its juice and all the chopped fruit back to the sauce to kinda give extra bright bursts of kind of fresh flavor to this like cooked down sauce. So. so now that I have all the ingredients in the pot, I wanna bring this to a boil and give it a stir just to kind of help you know, the sugar dissolve, the zest, and the cinnamon stick kind of mix and mingle with all those cranberries. And then once it comes up to a boil, we're gonna reduce the heat and let it kind of simmer away for about 10 minutes, which gives me plenty of time to cut up my orange. So what we're gonna do first is take a paring knife and cut off all the kind of bitter white pith from around the orange. So what I like to do first is trim off each end so you have a flat surface. And then you wanna take your knife and kind of like go in between the kind of like cells and flesh of the orange and the white pith and just kind of cut around like so until you kind of expose the flesh. Trim off all that white and then just keep going around the orange, kind of cutting right at the line of where the pith and the flesh meet in little strips until you get all that white pith off the flesh of the orange and kind of clean pieces just like that. And so once you have you know, all the pith removed from the, the orange, what you're gonna do is you're gonna work over a bowl and you're gonna take your paring knife again and in between each where the membranes are, you're gonna kind of cut up against the membrane on one side and then do the same on the opposite side to kind of remove each segment, just like that. And you kind of just work your way around, cutting on each side of the membrane to release the segments and let them fall into the bowl. Working over a bowl is really nice because any of the juice that drips down from the membrane as you work, it's gonna catch and we're gonna use that to stir into the cranberry sauce when it's done cooking. So once you get your last segment out, you wanna take all these membranes that you've just cut through and just kind of give them a squeeze and then we're gonna stir all that juice in the segments into the cranberry sauce once they're done. Because you want the segments to kind of be the same size as the cranberries, 
this kind of gives you little pops of kind of fresh orange fruit flavor in the midst of all that kind of cooked down cranberry sauce. Just kind of keep chopping them. When I'm done, I'll just add them back to the bowl of juice so we can stir it all into the cranberry sauce when it's done. This is pretty loose now, but once it cools and thickens up, it'll be nice and gelled. So take this off the heat. Now I'm gonna add the orange segments and juice. And again, this kind of adds just a little pops of freshness into the cranberry sauce. You had that like deep down cooked cranberry flavor. And this is just something to kind of wake it up. And you wanna stir these in off the heat so you don't kind of burst all those pieces of uh, orange that you chopped up. So we want those to kind of stay whole in the sauce. I'm just gonna pour it into a bowl to let it cool. Now you can let this cool to room temperature and serve it right away, but you can also make it honestly like three to four weeks ahead of time. As long as you keep it covered and in the refrigerator, it'll last until then. So I have some already that's been chilled. And I wanna show you the texture. See how much it thickens up, just like that. And so you can have this made ahead of time and you have a really simple classic cranberry sauce to serve at your Thanksgiving table. So the first thing you pass around the Thanksgiving table is a really soft, really buttery yeast roll. And I'm gonna show you my recipe to get rolls that are way better than what you can get from the freezer. So the first thing you're gonna need is some milk. So I have three quarters of a cup of whole milk and I've warmed it up to around 105 degrees. That's really like the perfect kind of temperature for yeast to grow in. And next we need to add some food for the yeast. So any kind of sweetener will do. You can definitely use white granulated sugar if you want to, but I like to add honey. And then one whole packet of active dry yeast. Now the difference between active dry and instant yeast is active dry needs to be kind of like woken up. The yeast needs to, it's kind of in hibernation. So you need to put it in some warm liquid, let it sit for about 10 minutes until it's nice and bubbling. Instant yeast, you don't need to do this whole process at all. You can just like mix it into the dough. And you just wanna stir the milk and the honey and yeast together. You're not dissolving the yeast, you're just making sure that the honey is dissolved in the warm milk, and that everything is evenly distributed. And now we're gonna set this aside for about 10 minutes until the yeast is really bubbling, and then we'll know it's ready to make our dough. So now that our yeast has been sitting away for about 10 minutes, and it's nice and bubbling on top, we're gonna add the rest of the ingredients. So the first thing we need is about two cups, which is around 284 grams of all-purpose flour. And then we're gonna add four tablespoons of butter. Now this is what's gonna give the rolls a really nice kind of soft texture. You know, when you're making things like cake or other kind of pastries, you want to not knead dough a lot and that's what kind of contributes its softness. But when it comes to these kind of yeast rolls like this, adding lots of fat like butter and milk, that's what's going to contribute to the softness of the dough. So we're gonna be adding a lot of butter throughout this recipe, but that makes for a really nice really soft and tender yeast rolls. So once most of the flour has been mixed in, but the dough hasn't come together quite yet, now is when we're gonna add our salt. So I have about a teaspoon of fine sea salt. So I'm just gonna mix all this together until it's really well distributed and the mixture comes into a nice kind of solid dough, just like this. And now we're gonna take the dough, pop it onto our work surface, and now you could absolutely do this in a stand mixer and it'd be much easier, but I'm gonna do this by hand. I'm gonna knead the dough, show you what it looks like. Just set a timer for 10 minutes. That's how long you're gonna knead, so here we go. What you wanna do is push the dough, bring it back with one hand or both hands, and just constantly rotate it, push it out, bring it back, rotate. As you bring it back, you can do one hand like that. As you like to press with one hand, bring back with the other onto itself. Just kind of do that repeatedly. You can switch hands if one arm gets tired. We're gonna do this over and over and over again. And after about 10 minutes, you're gonna see that this kind of shaggy, floury ball of dough is gonna transform into a really smooth, really tight ball of dough, and that's what you want. Okay, so I've been kneading for 10 minutes now, and you see you have a really nice, kind of smooth ball of dough. If you press your finger in it, and it kind of springs back, that's exactly what you want. I'm gonna shape my dough into a ball like this and I'm gonna return it to the bowl I used earlier. There's no need to grease it or anything. You can just pop the dough ball right in there just like that. And then we're gonna cover it with a sheet of plastic wrap. And that's gonna keep any air from drying out the dough. Just like 
that, make sure it covers the bowl completely. So I'm gonna stick the dough in a cold oven for about an hour until it's doubled in size, and then we'll come back and shape the rolls later. So now the dough has been rising for about an hour. So I have a nine inch round baking pan like this, and I'm just gonna brush it with some melted butter. This both helps kind of, you know, get the rolls out, of course, like greases the pan, but also is gonna soak into the bottom of the rolls once we shape them and put them in the pan. So you can be generous here. Use about two tablespoons and save this butter because we're gonna use this to brush on the rolls throughout the whole process as well. So I'm gonna set my pan off to the side and I'm gonna take my dough, kind of plop it out onto my work surface, press it lightly to kind of expel the gas from that first rising. And now I'm just gonna take my knife and you wanna cut this into 16 equal pieces. So I'm just gonna eyeball about 16 wedges here. So now that I've cut the round into 16 pieces, I'm gonna separate them, kind of set them aside, and work on them one at a time. And so this is probably the most important part when it comes to rolling yeast rolls like this. You know, most recipe instructions say to just roll into a ball, but if you do that, even in your hands like this, you'll get a ball, but see it's kind of like, the dough pieces aren't really sticking together, and then whenever that rises in the pan, it will kind of like unfurl and create a really ugly. So what we wanna do is take this dough ball and make a really tight outside to it. So how you do that is you basically want to press with your hand while kind of rotating the ball around on the counter like this. Kind of that same motion that we were using when we were kneading the dough at the beginning. And as you push and kind of rotate the ball, you wanna use your thumb just as kind of like a guide to keep it under your hand. And you just wanna do this over and over again. And you can kind of feel the dough where it touches your hand kind of tightening and stretching. And you do this over and over and over again until it feels really smooth. And then you have a nice little yeast roll ball, just like that, where the outside dough has kind of formed a really nice tight skin. If you look underneath, there's a hole there where you can see all the dough has gathered. That's exactly what you want. So I'm gonna keep rolling more dough balls, and I'm gonna transfer them to my buttered baking pan. And you wanna make sure that they're evenly spaced out doesn't have to be too crazy. You can do concentric circles or a spiral, whatever you want. And now we're gonna cover it with a sheet of plastic wrap. This is just to keep them from drying out. And I like to place the plastic wrap just over the top and then let these rise again for about 40 to 45 minutes just until the dough ball rises and starts to touch the plastic wrap. So now the rolls have been rising a second time for about 45 minutes until they just start to touch the plastic wrap. So I'm going to uncover them. These are nice and puffed and really soft. And I'm gonna brush them with two more tablespoons of our melted butter here. So you just wanna gently brush the tops. You don't wanna press the brush on top of the rolls because you'll deflate all the kind of the gas from the yeast that we've kind of built up as they rose. So just kind of gently brush the butter over each roll, perfect. Just like that. Now we're gonna transfer the rolls to a 325 degree oven until they're just light golden brown and cooked on the inside, about 20 minutes. So the rolls have baked for just 20 minutes. As you can see, they're really light golden brown, so 20 minutes for me is perfect. And now while they're still really hot, I'm gonna take even more butter and brush another like two tablespoons over the hot rolls. What this does is kind of allows the butter to really kind of soak into the rolls, makes them really soft, be generous. This is about two tablespoons of butter, which I know sounds like a lot, but again, it's really gonna soak into the rolls. The smell is fantastic. It's all this butter and the yeast and the honey from the rolls earlier. Perfect, just like that. And even though there's already salt in the dough, just to gild the lily a little more, make them special for Thanksgiving, I like to add just a pinch of flaky sea salt right in the center of each roll. And normally I would say, you need to let these cool all the way before you eat them, but I actually can't resist eating one right now. So I'm gonna pick one up. The best thing about these is you can eat them while they're still really hot. They're kind of steaming, kind of all that melted butter. It's kind of melted into every nook and cranny. Mm. Nice and light on the inside. This is just what I want for Thanksgiving. If you're making our classic pumpkin, pecan, or apple pies for Thanksgiving this year, this is a great all-purpose pie dough to use in those recipes. So 
the first thing we need to start with is flour. And this recipe uses all-purpose flour. And so what's really important is to actually weigh the flour. So this is two and three quarter cups of flour, which is kind of an odd volume measurement, but it's exactly 390 grams. And I found out this is the perfect amount of flour to use to make two pie discs to use for your standard nine inch pies. So we're gonna take all this flour and add it to a food processor. You can absolutely make pie dough by hand. I do it all the time, but honestly, the easiest way and the way to keep everything really cold, which is really important when making pie dough, is to use a food processor. It makes the job really quick, it goes fast, keeps everything cold again, which is really important. So we have our flour in the food processor. I'm gonna add two tablespoons of granulated sugar, use a teaspoon of kosher salt, and now we come to the butter. So this recipe uses a cup or two sticks of butter. Cut the butter stick in half like that, flip it over, Cut it in half again. So you kind of have like four lengthwise sticks and then turn it this way. And just cut it in like quarter inch, one third inch slices. And you'll see they kind of break up into these nice little cubes that we'll then add into the flour and that'll help cut them in really quickly to the flour. A lot of grocery stores sell like high fat European butters. I find that when you use kind of European high fat butter, it can kind of make the pie dough a little too fatty. So in this case, we actually want good old American standard butter because it has the right amount of butter fat and water to use for making pie dough. So we're gonna put all this butter into the dish so we can put it in the refrigerator and keep it cold before it goes into the flour. So now we have the butter nice and chilled. And so we're gonna pour it into the food processor. Just gonna put the cover on the food processor. And then we're gonna pulse it and you'll see whenever the butter gets to be about the size of like pea-sized crumbles. But this was about eight pulses. Here's what you wanna look for. You want the butter right there to be like, again, the size of peas. So there's kind of little small crumbles. And what that size is important for is that whenever you mix the dough together and you roll it out and it hits the heat of the oven, those small little pockets of butter are what is gonna kind of inflate the dough around it and make a really flaky, crispy pie crust. So now that we have the butter pieces at the right size we want them for the pie dough, we're gonna add the ice cold water to the pie crust as well. So what I like to do is actually take my water and I have two thirds of a cup of ice cold water and kind of pour it down the funnel tube of the food processor while I pulse the dough. This really ensures that you're moistening the dough evenly, or moistening the flour evenly, so it makes for an even pie crust. Just keep pulsing a little bit at a time until you don't have any kind of like dry pockets of flour, and the dough is just starting to come together at the bottom a little, and you kind of form these like nice big crumbles, just like that. So I'm gonna take all the dough from the food processor just kind of turn it out onto your cutting board. And then all you really want to do is just bring everything together. Press this mound of butter and flour and water until it kind of holds together. Just cut it right down the middle in half. Because again, this makes two pie crusts for two nine inch pies. So I'm gonna set one off to the side. And I'm gonna take this half, and just kind of turn it on its side and then press it down quickly. And just keep turning it Pressing it lightly until it comes together in a nice disc. You don't want to work this too much. You just want to get it into a nice even disc that you can then roll out later. So once you have a nice disc like this, put it straight onto some plastic wrap. We're gonna wrap this up and then stick it in the fridge. We'll go rest for an hour. You can also, if you want to, and freeze these for about six months if you want to make them ahead of time, but just be sure to thaw them for about a day or two in the refrigerator before you roll them out for your pies. So our pie crust has been chilling for about an hour in the refrigerator. So what I'm gonna do is take a little bit of flour in my hands and you kinda wanna sprinkle your work surface with like an even dusting of flour. And then unwrap the pie dough. So put the pie crust on the flour and then you wanna sprinkle the top with a little more flour as well. And then I'm gonna take my rolling pin, do the same thing, put a little bit of flour, just make sure that nothing sticks. And what you wanna do is just take your rolling pin and like with the middle of it, I'm gonna strike in one direction, 
turn it an eighth of a turn and then do the same thing and then keep going until the pie dough has like flattened out enough to where I can roll it without it stretching too much. So here we go. At this point, again, I'm gonna flour the top a little more just to make sure nothing sticks. Flour the rolling pin. Then what I'm gonna do is always start in the very center of the disc and then roll out one or two pushes just like that. Pick it up, move it around, center, roll out, pick it up, move it around. And again, this continues just to make sure the pie dough doesn't stick, but we're also rolling the dough out very evenly. By the time you kind of get back to the start, you have a nice nine to 10 inch pie crust, which is about an eighth of an inch thick, which is exactly what you want. And then when it comes time to transfer the pie dough, what I like to do is roll it up on a rolling pin, set the rolling pin at the front edge, just like this, and then bring the pie dough over it. And if you see any extra flour on the bottom or the edges, you can kind of dust it off with your hands, just like that, as you go. Until you get to the edge, make sure there's no extra flour. And then I'm gonna put this on a baking sheet lined with parchment paper, because I'm gonna use it later. And so then you can kind of unfurl it onto your baking sheet, just like that. And then this will go into the refrigerator to chill until I'm ready to use it. So I've got my rolled out pie dough ready to go. It's been chilling. So I'm gonna transfer it to a pie pan. I'm gonna use my rolling pin to lift the dough. And then I'll unfurl it over my pie pan. Kinda of wanna aim for the middle so you have a little bit of overhang. And then what you wanna do is you don't want to press the pie dough into the pie pan. You wanna kinda of lift up these edges, and just kinda of gently guide them into the sides and bottom, just so they kind of rest in the bottom of the pan. And then when you get all the way around, just kinda of feel to make sure there's no like kind of gaps at the edge of the pie pan where it meets the pie dough. And I like to gently, just kind of like lightly press around the edge of the pie pan just so I can see where the edge actually is. So then I'll take my scissors and trim the dough, cut the trimmings so they're about half an inch from the edge of the actual pie pan itself. I'm gonna go all the way around. And so once I have all the excess pie dough trimmed away, what I wanna do is take this outer edge right here and I wanna fold it under to where it just meets the lip of the pie pan and then kind of fold it back down. So you have this like nice rounded double thick layer of pie dough it goes all the way around the edge of the pie pan. So then once you have the full edge made around the whole pan, you wanna take your thumb and index finger of your right hand and your thumb of your left hand, or opposite if you're left-handed, and just kind of press the edge together. A lot of people I know use their knuckle to make slightly bigger ridges. You can do that as well. You can also take a fork and just kind of crimp along the outside So there I have perfectly formed pie crust. I can put this in the refrigerator or the freezer, and I can use this to make all sorts of you know, single crust pies like our pecan pie or our pumpkin pie. And you can use this right away. You don't need to um, chill it any further if it's gonna go right into the oven, or you can, but if you want to blind bake it, I'm gonna show you how to do that next. So if you've ever wondered what is blind baking, it's simply just pre-baking a pie crust without any filling to kind of give it a head start when you're making things like pumpkin pies or fruit pies that have really wet fillings. So that ensures that you get a really crisp crust that's cooked through by the time the actual fruit filling gets baked as well. So here's how to start. Take a sheet of parchment paper. You can use foil if you want to, but you would need to grease it. I like parchment paper because it won't stick to anything. So you wanna take your parchment paper sheet and you wanna crumble it up. Unfurl it. And do it again. Just keep doing this over and over again to make lots of little creases all over the parchment paper so that when you unfold it at last, you have a really moldable sheet of parchment paper that will fit into all the sides of the pie dough without creating those like really harsh ridges. So once we get our parchment paper 
in the pie crust, like so. We want something to weight it down. You can definitely buy things called pie weights, which are used for this purpose to kind of weigh down the pie dough. But you can also use rice. What I like to use is just dried beans. So I take about three and a half, four cups of beans, pour them right into the center of the pie, press them in lightly just to make sure that the weight of the beans is distributed evenly in the pie crust, just like that. So I'm gonna put this in a 375 degree oven for about 20 to 25 minutes. And what you're looking for is for the edge of the pie crust to just get light brown. So now the pie crust has been baking for about 25 minutes and you wanna see a light golden brown color at the edge. And that lets me know that the crust has baked through and will continue to bake through when I add my fillings. So what I wanna do now is take the parchment paper that I used earlier, kind of grab the corners, use it as a sling to kind of lift up all the beans, set these off to the side. The bottom is still slightly underdone, but the bottom crust touching the pan is fully crisp. Now you can use this right away to pour in your pumpkin pie filling, your pecan pie filling, any kind of fruit pie you wanna make, or you can let this cool completely, wrap it in plastic wrap, let it sit at room temperature for a day or two before you use it, or you can stick it in the fridge or the freezer and store it for up to a month. Just make sure you thaw it again before you use it for making all your pies for Thanksgiving. There's no more comforting or classic of a fall dessert than apple pie, and I'm gonna show you how to make the simplest recipe for your Thanksgiving table. The first thing we need is pie dough. So I have two discs that I've already pre-rolled, and they're sitting in the fridge, staying cold, which is really important while we work on our filling. But before we make the filling, we're gonna make an egg wash. So an egg wash is just egg mixed with water. You can use milk or cream, anything like that to kind of loosen it. And it's just kind of the glue that we're gonna use for the pie. So you just wanna mix one egg with a tablespoon of water. Just mix it together with a fork. And then we're just gonna set this aside until we need it. So next we have three pounds of apples. And for me, that's kind of the perfect amount. Some recipes use a little less. Some I've seen use like six pounds. It's like a big mounded pie. It's best to use a mix of apples. You can definitely use something like all Granny Smith apples, which are really tart, which are really nice balance with all the sugar and spices that we use. But I like to use, you know, some Fuji, some Honey Crisp as well, a mix of tart and sweet, some firmer apples, some softer apples, because it gives a nice like balance of textures in the pie. So what I'm gonna do now is just peel each of these apples and then chop them up into wedges. What I like to do is just like cut off each kind of like lobe around the apple, like so. So you have a nice clean core that you can be done with. And just kind of cut in about a quarter inch to a third inch wedges. You can also, if you want to, you know, cut the apples in quarters, like so. And then I like to come at an angle, take the core out of the apple like that. So now that I have all my apples sliced up, I'm gonna add the rest of the filling ingredients. So I add about three quarters of a cup of sugar, and then I add about a half a cup of flour, which again is a little more than what other recipes call for, but I like this because it thickens up the juices enough so they don't run out all over the place, but it's not too thick where it's kind of gloppy. And then we have about two tablespoons of fresh lemon juice. Again, to me, the kind of taste of apple pie is definitely kind of like a lemony cinnamon filling, so you definitely want to use fresh lemon juice there. We have two teaspoons of vanilla extract, two teaspoons of ground cinnamon. If you like more cinnamon, add more or less. You can add nutmeg if you'd like to as well, ground ginger, allspice, cloves, things like that, but I kind of like just plain cinnamon, traditional cinnamon. And then we have about a teaspoon of salt. So now that everything is over the apples, just give it a toss. And you'll see it'll look kind of dry at first, but just kind of keep tossing. And make sure that all the apple slices are separated. And what's gonna happen is the sugar is gonna kind of draw out some of the moisture from the apples. And by the time you give them a toss, make sure they're all coated. They'll be nice and covered in this like kind of cinnamony, sweet, vanilla, lemon goo, which is gonna thicken in the oven and kind of hold all the apples together when they bake up. Okay, so now that all the apple slices are coated in the cinnamon and sugar and flour, 
I'm gonna go grab our two sheets of pie dough. So here I've got my two sheets of pie dough that I've pre-rolled and I kind of stack them on a baking sheet with parchment paper in between. That just helps to keep them from sticking. So what you wanna do is first take the first pie dough. I like to roll it up on my rolling pin. Just makes it easier to transfer to the pie pan. Just kind of unfurl it over the pie dish like that. And then you kind of want to take the pie dough and just gently lift up the edges to kind of guide them into the pan. You don't really want to press, push or pull anything at this point because it might toughen the dough and it would spring back. So you want to kind of just barely lift up the pie dough, just kind of let it fall into the bottom of the pan. Just kind of feel the bottom to make sure everything is nice and even in there. I'm going to leave the edge as it is for now. And we're going to take our filling. And after it sits for a while, sometimes, you know, the filling can kind of separate from the apples. So you just want to give it a nice stir to make sure everything's really even. One more time. And what I like to do is just kind of pile all the apples right in the center of the pie dough. And it's a lot and they're going to mound up on top, but just try to get them all to fit at least inside the pie. You want a nice mound of apples because they're going to cook down when they bake. So that way they're nice and level by the time the pie is done. I find the best thing to do, just use your hands to kind of press them around. Clean hands, of course. Just kind of press the apples down, kind of shimmy them a little bit. Make sure they're really even. Make sure you don't have any apples that are kind of sticking out that might poke through the, the crust. So now that I have all the apples in the pie pan, it's time to cover them. So before we do that though, we're gonna take a little bit of that egg wash that we made earlier, and we're gonna brush it just around the edge, and that's gonna help the next pie dough we place on top stick to the bottom. So just dip your brush, and you don't wanna like slather this on, you just want a light coating. Lightly paint it around the edge, just like this. And now we're gonna to top it with the second sheet of pie dough. You kind of want to line up the pie crust as much, best as possible, but not super important. And now once you have the top crust on, I like to gently just kind of press at the edges, again, where we brushed our egg wash, just to make sure it sticks together. And then also, now that we see where the edge of the pie pan is, we know where to trim. So you want to trim off the crust and leave yourself about half an inch of overhang. Just like that. And then once we're done trimming, we're gonna fold that under, and that's gonna create a nice, beautiful crust for the edge of the pie. So now that we have all the trimmings off the pie, I'm gonna take the edge here and kind of lift it up while bending it under, so that that edge now sits on the top of our pie pan. And I'm just gonna keep going around every inch, just kind of lifting up folding back under, kind of lightly pressing it against the edge. And again, this is gonna create a nice, beautiful, thick border of pie dough. So now we have the edge of the pie all rolled under to have a nice, thick outer edge. And at this point, you could use a fork to crimp it, but I kinda like to use my fingers again to kinda make that really classic, kind of fluted pie edge. You can go big, you can go small. You don't have to crimp at all, but it really makes it look really nice and you know it's thanksgiving so you kind of want to impress your guests with a beautiful pie so and crimping is a very easy way to do that so now that i have the edge crimped like this we're going to give the whole pie a brush with egg wash brush a nice even layer of egg wash and also make sure not to neglect the edges because those need to be brown too so just kind of dab at the edge just like this and at the top and now that i've got all the egg wash brushed over the pie. The final step is just to cut a few slits in the top of the pie. This helps to let a lot of the steam that's gonna build up from the apples, the moisture in the apples, escape. And it's gonna help to cook those apples once they're in the oven. So I like to cut about four inch long slits evenly around the pie. And then really importantly, make a hole right in the center as well. That's kinda like to stab the knife in. That kinda cross hatch pattern. Because you'll know the pie is done when the steam and juices are bubbling from that center. So it's really important so you have 
little hole there to judge that by. And you also, you wanna do this after you've brushed with egg wash because if you cut the slits, then brush with egg wash, sometimes egg wash can seal them up. And we wanna keep them open to allow that steam to escape. And it's gonna go in a 375 degree oven for about an hour and a half. So the apple pie is cooled till almost room temperature. I like it when it's actually a little bit warm. So I'm gonna cut into it and show you what it looks like. Great. The pie is super buttery. You have pieces of apple, but also some cooked bits as well. Kind of put those back in there just like that. It smells like lots of cinnamon, lemon juice, and beautiful apples. That to me is perfect apple pie. Pecan pie is a classic southern dessert that's become an indispensable part of my Thanksgiving table. So the first thing we need is a blind baked crust. This is using our simple pie dough recipe that you can find on latimes.com. We we'll wanna make sure we get that done before we start on our filling. So I'm just gonna set that to the side. So the first thing we're gonna do is actually brown some butter. So I'm just gonna heat a skillet over about medium heat and add about half a stick of butter, four tablespoons. And when you brown butter, you wanna do this process slowly. You can absolutely do it over high heat if you're in a rush, but you better know what you're doing. So I like to do it over low heat or medium heat at the highest. So we're just gonna let this melt completely and then we're gonna keep stirring it until it becomes nice and brown and nutty. Okay, so while the butter is melting, we're gonna work on our vanilla bean. A vanilla bean is kind of, while it has, you know, vanilla has the kind of like reputation for being like a sweet flavor. They're super aromatic, really floral, but also kind of bitter. So going back to our butter, you just wanna stir it. What's gonna happen is the butter's gonna melt. It's gonna be foaming a lot and kind of like bubbling, but then you'll kind of notice that when it stops bubbling and kind of goes quiet, that's when you start to smell the nuttiness too. That's when you know you're almost there. So that's when you wanna watch it and just make sure it doesn't burn. And this is perfect. The solids are nice and brown, light golden brown, but not too dark. So I'm gonna take it off the heat. I'm immediately gonna stir in those vanilla seeds. So once you stir those in, they mix with all the like caramelized milk solids from the brown butter. And this smells fantastic too. It's just, you know, vanilla seeds and brown butter. Like what else do you want? Now we're gonna add our corn syrup. You know, most recipes, traditional recipes, call for about one cup of corn syrup. You can take it down to three quarters of a cup and that works perfectly for me. So I like to actually add it to the hot butter in the skillet, stir that. And also adding the corn syrup here cools down the brown butter. So it really doesn't continue to cook. Now we're gonna add half a cup of sugar. And these last two ingredients are the other key to a really good pecan pie. I use a full tablespoon of fresh lemon juice. The acid really helps to kind of cut through all the sugar, all the corn syrup. So I like to stir that in. And then a half a teaspoon of kosher salt. So now that all this is really evenly mixed, I'm gonna transfer it to a bowl so we can stir in our eggs and pecans. And now that this corn syrup mixture is cooled now, we're gonna add our eggs straight into the bowl. I love seeing all the like flecks of vanilla bean in there as well. So we're gonna set that aside. Now we're gonna add our pecans. So I like to use about two cups of pecans. I don't wanna chop them too finely. Just want them broken up so they're not whole like that. That's perfect. Then we're gonna add all these straight into the bowl of our filling. Back to our spatula and just stir to make sure the pecans are really well mixed. And now we're gonna grab our blind baked crust from earlier. Just pour the filling straight in. Just kind of use your spatula to kind of zhuzh them around, make sure all the nuts are really evenly incorporated in the pie, just like that. And now we're gonna set this on a baking sheet and put it in a 375 degree oven for about 10 minutes and then take the temperature down to 325 and let it bake for about 30 to 35 more minutes until it's set.
So now that the pie is out of the oven, while it's still warm, I actually like to sprinkle a little bit of flaky sea salt on the top. And again, along with the vanilla bean, the lemon juice, and the brown butter, this just kind of helps to balance all the sweetness that's in the pie. So just a little bit of flaky sea salt on top. So now this is here, I'm gonna let this cool completely before we serve it. To me, this is the perfect ratio of like kind of like eggy custard goo to pecans, some nice sea salt on top. That's a great pecan pie for Thanksgiving. Pumpkin pie is essential for Thanksgiving, and I'm gonna show you how to make the best recipe for this classic Thanksgiving dessert. Now the first thing we need is a blind baked pie crust. This is using our simple pie dough recipe, which you can find at latimes.com. And you wanna make sure you do this before you start the filling. A blind baked pie crust is really important in a pie like this because the smooth filling needs a contrast of a crisp, crunchy pie crust. So you wanna make sure you get this done before you start your filling. So now to make the filling, first thing we need is pumpkin. Now, of course, if you're the type of person who you know, makes their own you know, pumpkin, you like roast your own pumpkin or your butternut squash or sweet potatoes, you can obviously use your own like puree of roasted pumpkins, but most people I know, they're not doing that. So just use the good old canned stuff. I really like it. The flavor is always really consistent. And also the color is also what you expect because when you kind of roast your own pumpkins or squashes, it can kind of look uh, yellow brown and not really like a beautiful orange color. So after the pumpkin, we're gonna add uh, one and three quarter cups of light brown sugar. Now you can use regular granulated sugar if you want to, but I really like that kind of molassesy bitter edge that brown sugar has. It also helps to kind of balance all the sweetness. Now the next thing we need is our pumpkin pie spices, the classic pumpkin pie spices, which are typically just cinnamon and nutmeg. And uh, you know, a lot of the recipes are more cinnamon dominant uh, or have a lot more nutmeg. I like to kind of balance them. So I just use about two teaspoons of ground cinnamon and then about a teaspoon of ground ginger actually, which I really like with anything pumpkin related, kind of brings out that flavor really well. And then we need about half a teaspoon of fresh nutmeg. The fresh grated stuff tastes a lot different and a lot better, so and it takes like two seconds just to grate it yourself. So, and then measure out about half a teaspoon. Always just like to grind my own, like that. And then, of course, one of the most important things is salt. So we're gonna do about a teaspoon of kosher salt, which sounds like a lot, but you really need it. And then what I like to add to kind of like, so you know sometimes pumpkin can get that kind of like watery texture that kind of separates and we don't really want that. So I like to add about a tablespoon of cornstarch and that just helps to kind of gel up any loose liquid that's in the pie and also helps create a really smooth filling as well. So what I like to do is actually add the sugar, the spices and the cornstarch first and kind of mix them with the pumpkin. This creates like a really kind of thick paste. And what that does is that it removes any lumps from the spices and the sugar and it makes sure that all the spices are really well distributed in the pie and in the filling. You don't have clumps of cornstarch or sugar or cinnamon or anything like that. So you just want to whisk those well. And then from here, we're just going to thin it out with our liquid ingredients. So I'm going to add about a teaspoon of vanilla, which is classic in a pie like this. And I'm going to add two eggs. And I always try to break them in a bowl first, just in case you get a bad one. Just kind of whisk those in a little bit. Again, kind of just thinning it out as we go. And then the last thing we need is a can of evaporated milk. You know, if you're really against using any kind of, you know, canned milk like this, you can absolutely use regular whole milk, but evaporated milk is like super condensed milk and so it has a much richer flavor and so it will taste different but you know you could also use uh, the same amount of like half and half if you wanted to. I wouldn't use cream just because that is a little too thick uh, compared to what evaporated milk is but you know you can choose your own level of richness whether you want to use evaporated milk, regular whole milk or half and half. So then you just want to whisk this together until it's really smooth and combined and kind of emulsified and comes together. And that's it, that's your pumpkin pie filling. So what we're gonna do now is pour it into our blind baked crust. And oftentimes, a lot of recipes call for deep dish pie pans or 
nine inch pies or a lot of recipes make two different pies, but I kind of like to use, uh, you know, an entire can for each recipe. So if you have a nine inch pie like this, you'll see that all of it will fit in the pie crust just perfectly. So now we're gonna pop this on a baking sheet and put it in a 375 degree oven for about an hour. So the pie's been baking for about an hour and you can see the crust has gotten a little bit darker brown and the filling is nicely set. So we're gonna let this sit aside and cool completely because a lot of the cooking happens actually while they're cooling. They're gonna to continue to heat up and that produces a really smooth filling. If you cook it all the way in the oven and then take it out, it'll kind of get curdled and overcooked and kind of like a cheesecake, it might crack on top. And we don't want that. We want a nice smooth filling. So we're gonna let that cool. And while that happens, we're gonna make a flavored whipped cream to go on top of it. So, you know, I always love to have whipped cream alongside my pumpkin pie and usually I just sweeten it with a little sugar and maybe like some vanilla, but you know, it's the holidays, make something a little bit nicer. So I'm actually use a little bit of Grand Marnier. This is like an orange liqueur. And I really like it because the orange flavor kind of pairs with, you know, the flavor and the color of pumpkin. So I do about a tablespoon, but you can add as more or little to your heart's desire. And then all you wanna do is just whisk it with a hand mixer. So you wanna keep mixing the cream until it just starts to form soft peaks. I actually like to under whip the cream just a little bit till it just like forms kind of like soft, stiff peaks. And that's because it's really great to make this ahead of time, let it sit in the fridge for a couple hours. And that way, whenever it's time for you to serve the pie, you have the whipped cream ready. So the pie is cool completely. So we're gonna take a slice right through the middle. And again, remember we Blind bake the crust so it made sure to really have a nice crisp crust that's cooked through and browned with all this like smooth pumpkin filling. And we took the pie out just before the center was completely set so that when it, by the time it cooled, it kind of set really nicely. And this is exactly the kind of texture you want, just like that. We don't want any like overcooked pumpkin pie. And then just take a spoon. You can dollop it on top of the pie. But as you like to just do a little dollop right on the side. Again, those nice soft peaks. And there you go, classic pumpkin pie, orange whipped cream. I think everyone's gonna love it.